Welcome back to Kuala Lumpur. It's another day and I have a very small mission for today and that's just to go shopping. I need to buy SD cards for this camera and I thought I would go to <clears throat> Lo Yat Plaza. It's one of the biggest, if not the biggest, electronics markets in uh, Kuala Lumpur. It's quite a fascinating place, so I thought I would take you along with me. And we can walk through the streets, see a little bit of Kuala Lumpur. You'll have to uh, forgive my voice. I've been fighting a cold for a week now, and I, it just won't go away. <clears throat> As I said before, my hostel is in uh, Chinatown in Kuala Lumpur. And uh, I'm not going to go into the Chinatown market today, but we're going to take a street that's going to go right past it, and I can show you the gate, which is the entrance into the uh, China, main Chinatown market. And that is it over there, Jalan Petaling, Petaling Street, and that's the main Chinatown uh, market street. It's midday right now, so it's not that busy. At night, this whole street will be jammed with people and uh, can't even make your way down there. Uh, Chinatown is an interesting area to stay in Kuala Lumpur. Here's another one of the main streets in uh, Chinatown. It becomes uh, very busy at night. Years ago, I don't remember colds being such a big thing. I would get a cold and uh, blow my nose a lot and <clears throat> get on with my life. But in the last few years, a cold just puts me under. I can't sleep at night and night after night goes by without sleep. So you just end up feeling worse and worse and worse until the cold finally goes away. And it's on its way out, but I'm so beat I can barely uh, think straight. So if I start babbling at you, uh, that's why. Lo Yat Plaza where I'm going. It's kind of an interesting place because it's hardcore electronics. It's not like a shopping mall. There are a couple of hundred, many hundreds of small shops on every single floor and uh, these guys give you the hard sell whenever you go in there. It's a place that can be a little bit intimidating actually and they have this interesting setup where they have an escalator that goes up <clears throat> but in order to get from one escalator to the next, you have to walk around in a circle, then go up and around in a circle. And every time you go around in that circle, you pass like half a dozen or a dozen of these little shops. You, you, you have to. You get forced into this narrow alley, and all these guys on both sides of you are giving you the sales pitch. You know, what do you need? A cell phone, computer, come here, come here, come here. I got it, I got it. I'll, I'll give you a good price, best price, you know? And you really have to keep your head down and uh, just keep walking or <clears throat> you'll come out of there with like 10 computers and 15 phones that you didn't even need. I keep mentioning all the construction in Kuala Lumpur and here's a very good example. I just happened to look across the street and I can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight or nine uh, construction cranes. All kinds of buildings going up over there. Keeping up with the construction theme, still on my way to Loyat Plaza, another big construction site right here. I love monorails. They have such a weird combination of atmosphere. It's like they're super futuristic the way they glide along on what looks like one track. And at the same time, they all look like they're 500 years old. They look like old technology that's slow and creaky and falling apart. And yet they're the symbol of uh, the future, you know? All goes back to that uh, classic Simpsons episode, you know, monorail. I've been to Loyette Plaza quite a few times, and I've developed a habit of uh, taking the elevator to go up. And if you take the elevator, you can avoid all the hard sell from all the shops as you circle up on the escalator. 
but since I'm bringing you along with me, I'm going to take the escalator and keep the camera running, I hope, and then you can sort of see all the shops. It shouldn't be that bad, it shouldn't be that bad today though, because uh, it's just not a busy day, I don't think. And I don't know how it happens either, but another habit of mine <laughs> seems to be that I always end up going in the back way. I never seem to find the front entrance of anything, and that happened with Loyad as well. A long time ago when I first came here, I found the only way I could get in was down this alleyway and through these tiny little side doors over here and this white building here, five or six stories high, that's a low yacht. And I'm sure it has a main entrance somewhere, but I've never found it. And uh, the only way I know how to get here is this weird path that I took and then going down this alley into those side doors. I guess maybe I feel like I don't deserve the main entrance or something. I'm like, I have to use the servant's entrance, you know? Plaza Loya, Malaysia's largest IT lifestyle mall. And that's where we're going. talking about you come up on this escalator but in order to get up to the next level you have to walk around and go past all these little shops to get to the next escalator up hello sir hello so nice well can you open what's that it's just the uh, the hood yeah. you know lens hood Why you buy the fixed filter from the plaster pill? You should buy Hoya better. Yeah, maybe. Because you see, it's lens your all fungus already. Mm. You must change your filter, Hoya filter. Yes. The camera is very good. I know this camera. This camera, take video, take picture is very nice. You buy Hoya filter is perfect. Why? Why don't you like this filter? Why not? Come, I show you. <laughs> you should try this. Horizon filter. Yeah, well, I'm pretty happy with this filter, you oh. know, it works fine. And this crash. <laughs> if you do this filter, my customer tried before, yeah. use, it will become fungus. Oh, okay. Yes, You do very All right. I can show you before and after, after you put, right. if you want to see. No, it's okay. Like I said, I'm, I'm okay with this filter. It's not that important to me. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, you want accessory? No, it's all right. I don't know how much of that was caught on, on video, but that was a real hard sell. He was trying to sell me a new filter for this camera, telling me that my filter was causing fungus. It's a B&W filter, which is like the best you can buy. But he wanted me to buy a Hoya from him. He was pretty insistent too. He had uh, so much salesmanship, I found myself almost wanting to buy a Hoya just to please him, you know? And when I finally fought off that, he wanted to sell me batteries for this uh, camera. And again, I'm practically taking my wallet out of my pocket to give him money for the battery, you know? He's that good. I just can't resist a sales pitch. And that was only going up, uh, I think, one floor. I have to go, I have to do it again to get to the next escalator. So uh, we'll see what happens. I escaped unscathed uh, that time. <laughs> Nobody got their hooks into me. Anyway, I'm heading up to uh, an upper floor. There's like a kind of a hypermart, sort of like a department store for electronic stuff. It's the best place I know of to get uh, memory cards. Nothing on that level. I'm feeling kind of ignored now. I'm feeling, uh, my feelings are hurt. Nobody's trying to sell me anything today, except for that first guy. <laughs> anyway, he was pretty good. 
And there's my uh, favorite store over there, the All IT Hypermark Hypermarket. Hypermarket. Yeah, it's kind of a low-key place. It's not like these small shops. It's like a big store, and. The salespeople will come to help you and talk to you, but you know, it's more more casual, more relaxed. So I'm gonna head in here, see what they have in the way of SD cards. And of course, here is uh, something that I would love to have. I think the GoPro Hero Seven Black. That'd be fun. And here we are, memory cards. I think I know what I want. I just have to uh, look at this uh, huge display. Flash drives at the top, and then memory cards down at the bottom. Oh, these are all uh, micro, micro SD. I need the full SD. My favorite store led me down. I went in there expecting a massive display of every SD card on the planet, and there were none of them. And I spoke to a sales clerk, and he said, no, we don't sell those anymore. They're old-fashioned. Nobody uses them anymore. And a lot of salespeople tell me a lot of odd things to make me buy stuff, but that seemed like a stretch, that nobody uses SD cards anymore. I pressed him on that, and what he was talking about was that action cameras use micro SD cards. And I guess they don't sell enough SD cards to make it worth their while to stock them. So they don't even stock them. It's kind of crazy. So I went to another store, and I had my usual experience. This always happens to me. I go online, I do a ton of research, and I nail down the best SD card in my price range. That's the one that I want. And every article I read recommends it. This is the best one to get. Value for money, this is the best. This is the best, no question. Number one, don't accept any other SD card. I go out to the stores, they'll have every card on the market except that one card that everybody says is the best one to get. And I've never been able to figure out why that always happens to me. Anyway, all my careful notes about what SD card to buy, all good for nothing. And I bought some other card, and they're going to be absolutely fine. But uh, it's always funny the way that happens. Time to uh, head out and, uh, I guess, go back to my hostel. That's all I needed to do today. A very simple mission. I think before I head out of here, I'm going to drop in on a, a camera store that I know. They don't have a lot of camera stores in this mall, but uh, there's one or two that I like. And I'm going to pop in and see what kind of advice they can give me. And there's my camera store, Photochem. Photochem is actually kind of an ordinary sort of camera store, but I always find the, the sales staff there to be really helpful. And it's, I can get really close to the cameras and uh, get a good look at them. Let's see what's going on. Well, I got my SD cards, so that was my mission accomplished for today. But there's so many weird bits of psychology that go into almost everything I do. When I buy something, I really want the thing that I want. I want it to be good, of course. But I also want the shopping experience to be good. I want to feel good about the sales clerk and the cashier. I want to feel good about the whole experience, not just about the product. So I often go into these shopping situations feeling a bit defensive because I don't want things to go wrong. I don't want the feeling to go bad, right? So in this case, everything went wrong. I went to the first store and they didn't even have SD cards. Like they don't have any SD cards. So I'm, I'm shot down right from the beginning. But that meant I had to go to another store and I knew the experience wouldn't be good there because it's the kind of store where you get no service at all. They just grunt at you, expect you to buy something. If you don't want to buy it, get out of my store, that kind of thing. And what I do is, if a sales clerk approaches me, I'll try to be lighthearted. I'll really smile and I'll try to say something funny. I'll try to like loosen up the atmosphere because I want him to be my friend and I want to talk about SD cards. I want to turn it into a social occasion. And after I buy it, I can feel really good about the whole experience of what I bought. 
But this guy at that store was giving me nothing at all. You know, I told a joke, I told another joke, I told him my experience with SD cards and what I'm looking for, and he just blank, blank face, nothing. He wasn't giving me anything in return, and uh, just didn't feel good at all. But I decided just to buy the cards anyway. I grabbed two of them, and then a funny thing happened that uh, I don't know where the cash register is. I'm looking around, there's no cash registers anywhere, so I don't know how to pay. And he points at the ground and says, uh, see that arrow down there? You just follow the arrows, and the arrows will bring you to a cashier. <laughs> I laughed at that, and I smiled at him. I made a joke about following the arrows. Still, stone face, nothing at all. I'm getting nothing from this guy. But anyway, I follow the arrows, and the arrows just take me on this long, winding path through what feels like five, six, seven other stores, and I finally get to a cashier, and there's five women sitting beside cash registers. And I still want the shopping experience to feel good, so I'm trying to pick which one of them is going to be the nicest, which one is going to smile at me, which one will be friendly. I finally pick one, Totally bad choice. Stone face. Not only stone face, she never looked at me. She was chatting with the other cashier beside her. They ignored me the entire time. I tried again, you know, I made a little joke. I smiled. I, I said something about how I followed the arrows and I found you. Isn't that funny? Nothing. She just stone cold face. So the whole experience was uh, pretty bad. But I have my SD cards, so I'm going to break one out and I'll show one to you in a second. By the way, I'm drinking another vanilla Coke. I just love these things. Anyway, here is my new purchase. SanDisk Extreme SDXC UHS-1 card. And with all those letters and numbers, it, uh, it has to be good, right? 64 gigabyte. 90 megabyte per second transfer speed. Everything looks good. So the reason I bought this card is that since I started shooting video, this is a new thing for me, shooting video, my 16 gigabyte memory cards keep filling up on me. And my camera has no way to tell me that the card is full. So I'll be sitting here talking into the camera, talking and talking. And then I find out later that the card was full and nothing was recorded. And that has happened to me over and over and over again. So I finally decided it's time to get a bigger card. 64 gigabyte. That should do it. My experience at the uh, camera store unfortunately wasn't any better. I went in there without a real purpose. I've been looking at cameras online for a long time. This camera is breaking down and I need to replace it and I'm sort of stuck because it's an Olympus camera and I can't find an Olympus camera body that's suitable as a replacement. switching to a different brand and no brand has a camera that seems to be quite right for me. I just go around and around and around from Olympus to Panasonic to Sony to Canon and no, no existing camera seems like the right camera. Well there are some that would be amazing obviously but they cost $3,000 or $4,000 and I don't have that kind of money to spend on a camera. So in my price range, the camera companies have been releasing new cameras, but they have the habit of uh, crippling them. They'll release a camera that is perfect in every single way, but then they'll take one really important feature and take it out. They'll just leave it out. And so it's always one feature short of a perfect camera. And every camera company does it. Olympus does it. Canon does it, Sony just did it with their A6400, and it's uh, yeah, kind of driving me crazy. So I didn't go into the camera store with an idea of, oh, I want to buy that camera, and how much does it cost, and here's my credit card. 
I just wanted to go in more as a social occasion, talk about cameras. I figure a guy who works at a camera store is going to be as interested in them as I am, and he'll want to talk about the newest Olympus that was just released and all the problems with it, and then the new Sony that was just released and all the problems with it. So I went in there, again, feeling a little bit defensive because I knew the chances of having a good experience were pretty slim, but I had hopes. But I went in there, and the first sales clerk that I uh, talked to, nothing at all. She just looked at me like I was a lunatic. I was like, why are you talking to me, she was saying with her face. Do you want to buy a camera? Then buy one. If you don't want to buy a camera, then stop talking to me. Go away. And eventually a, <clears throat> a man came over. He was a little bit more of a camera geek, and I thought I could get him interested in talking. But he wasn't interested in talking. All he wanted to do was tell me what I should do. He just sort of made an announcement. He was like a typical man that way. He was the professional, he was the expert, and he just sort of said, do this. And he didn't want to talk at all. He just pronounced, he had these big camera pronouncements, you know? There was no give and take. There was no friendship developing, you know? So my whole shopping experience today was a bit of a bust. Didn't have a good time, but I got a vanilla Coke out of the deal, and I did get a couple of memory cards. So what else, what else can you ask for? I mentioned that I didn't have a good experience with the sales clerks at the uh, camera store. The woman was not interested in cameras at all. And she didn't know anything about cameras either. I think she just ran the cash register or something. And the man I mentioned was one of these guys that considers himself an expert and just pronounces on everything. But worse than that, and this is a trait you see in a lot of men, and it's a real pet peeve of mine, he didn't listen. He never heard a word I say. And I've run into so many men like that recently. It's like a type of person that for some reason I encounter constantly. So in this case, he would tell me something like, oh, that camera, don't get that one. You should buy this camera. It has 4K. And I would say, well, I don't need 4K. And he would just say, yes, 4K is better. I said, no, 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 no. I don't want 4K. My camera, my, my computer can't handle 4K. And he obviously didn't hear what I said because he just said, yes, 4K, very, very good. You, you buy that camera, it has 4K. And we went around and around like that on every topic. And every time I said something, he took it as me agreeing with him when on every, almost every case I was disagreeing with him. So it was very clear he wasn't listening to a word I said. And when you have someone like that, you very quickly lose interest in the social interaction. What's the point? What's the point of saying anything because he's not registering your words at all? I think of that as the father complex because a lot of dads do that. Dads reach middle age or something and they just stop listening. They just never hear you. They just talk and keep talking, never hear a word you say. <laughs> and I seem to run into men like that all the time lately, every age, not just middle age. And I ain't got time for that. You tell me if you do this. Again, I do this all the time lately. I go out shopping. I have a couple of things I want to get. I get something, I leave, I'm halfway home, and I realize I didn't get the other thing I wanted. Today, for example, I wanted to get those little ear muffs that you put on microphones to cut out wind noise. I've been wanting to get these for a long time because this Olympus camera has really bad wind noise on the microphone. And I thought while I was at the camera stores, I could ask them about that. Here I am walking back to my hostel and I just realized, I forgot. I didn't ask anybody. Uh, what is that? <laughs> Getting dumber every day. Every time I see one of these construction sites with all the big cranes, I can't help but thinking that 
being a crane operator would be a great job. Or a great job for me, anyway. I can see myself every day, you know, you got your thermos of coffee, your lunch pail. You climb up that long, long ladder, climb into your little cab, and all day you get to do these precise motions with your huge crane moving 20 tons of cement all the time. And you just sit up there all day long doing your job and then uh, come back down at the end of the day. It's kind of a skilled job too, so you'd think it would pay a fair amount of money. Then maybe you could even travel with a job like that. Maybe crane operators are in high demand all around the world. That's what I should have uh, studied in university instead of whatever it was I did study, you know, crane operator. Yeah. Next, uh, the next life I have, I'll be, uh, I'll come back as a crane operator. That will be me, way up there, listening to podcasts while I work. That would be amazing. In a certain way, I had a job like that. The best job I've ever had in my life was working at a ski resort in uh, Canada. And I was working a, a chairlift, and it was quite a remote chairlift. So the top shack was at the highest point of the entire ski resort. So it was very high up in the mountains, a little wooden shack where you sit and you kind of monitor everything that's going on and make sure everyone's safe. And quite often a storm would come in and they would close down the mountains temporarily so there'd be no skiers, no snowboarders, but I would stay up there in that shack, you know, all by myself, winter storm blasting around me, and it was the most amazing scene. Similar to being up there in that crane, except I was at the top of a mountain. And the great thing about that job, compared to other jobs I've had, is that when you finished at the end of the day, you were finished. There was no stress at all. You didn't have to worry about anything at night. You didn't have to prepare anything for the next day. You worked your day, and then you were done at the end of the day. That was a good job. The other good thing about that job was that it was in tourism. So all day long, you were working with people who were on holiday, but everybody was in a good mood. Everybody was happy all the time. Everybody was on their skiing holiday or snowboarding holiday. And as a ski lift attendant, I could help people. And I love doing that. It seems to make me happier than any other thing. It's just helping people. They would ask me questions about the ski resort, the best runs to go on, where they can go to do this or get that in the local community or in the surrounding towns. And I just loved being around tourists and helping them have a better vacation. Yeah, I really enjoyed that job. The problem with it, there's always a catch. The catch was that you made no money at all, so you could barely survive on what they paid you. And eventually I had to quit because I really couldn't survive month to month on, on the wage. So there's always a problem. If anyone has been paying close attention, they might have heard me mention how much I love goats. And look at this. Goat power. Super fest power or super best goat power. <laughs> I, I have no idea what it is. I have to get some goat power. And I found some cornflakes, but it comes in itty bitty tiny little boxes. Oh well, it's the best I can do today. I haven't found a Schwapno in Kuala Lumpur just yet, or at least not in this neighborhood. Check out these shells. Super stocked. Every bright and colorful little doodad you could ever hope for. <laughs> You're trying to give away your money today. I don't know if they do this commonly in Canada or not. They often have here like a wall of shame or pen curry. I'm sure it means thief or criminal or something like that. And they put up pictures of these shoplifters and robbers just to warn you about them. Shame them, I guess. 
<laughs> wonder what this guy's getting away with. He's trying to get away with a whole bunch of uh, free drinks. I don't think he can run very far with all those bottles. I'm almost back at my guest house after my errand run today to buy an SD card. What an adventure that was. I don't know if this will even turn into a video of any kind, but in case it does, this is where I'm going to end the video because I'm almost home again. And uh, I hope you enjoyed my thoughts as I rambled around the city of Kuala Lumpur. And I'll see you in the next video. The bonus question for the last video was about the drivers on the Sungai Bulo Kajang MRT line. How long do the drivers have to go to school to learn to operate the subway trains? Answer? It's a trick question. There are no drivers. It is a fully automated driverless system. Bonus question for this video. I mentioned that my favorite job in Canada was working as a lifty at a ski resort. What was my worst job ever in Canada? I'll give you two hints. Travelers often take this job and it involves a shovel. Any Canadians out there probably know the answer. Put your answer in the comments below. Answer at the end of the next video. Travel tip 13. Bring a stash of US dollars for emergencies when you go traveling, and make sure some of it is in small bills. When you bring a stash of cash with you, you're preparing for three different situations. The first is probably the most common, and this is when you land in a new country, you walk over to that ATM machine, put in your card, and it doesn't work. And there you are, you're stuck on the other side of the world in a strange country and you have no money and no way to get any. That's bad news. So if you have $50 or $40 or something like that, you can change that and you have enough local currency to get you through a couple of days until you get your ATM problems sorted out. This happens to a lot of people, it's surprising. The other situation you might face is more of an emergency. Your bag is stolen or you are robbed and your passport and ATM card are gone. So now you need a more substantial amount of money, something that might cover getting a new passport or a flight out of that country. And then you'd probably need two or three or four hundred dollars in cash to cover you in the case of an emergency. The final situation is something like arriving at the airport, you're leaving the country, you've spent all your local currency right down to the last peso, and suddenly they hit you with an airport tax, a departure tax, something like that, and now you're stuck. You don't want to get out your ATM card and withdraw a hundred dollars and pay transaction fees and exchange fees and all that kind of stuff. And this is when the small bills come in handy. So then you want to have $1 bills, $5 bills, $10 bills, or $20 bills, and then you can exchange a small amount of money to cover these little costs that they spring on you at the airport. I went to Bangladesh recently, and the visa on arrival costs $50 officially, but they actually charge you $51 they tell you that the one extra dollar is for some kind of tax. And a lot of people get stuck with this because they have $50 and they have, they have more money, but they don't have a $1 bill. Who does? I'll tell you who does. 
the smart traveler like you who makes sure he has a couple of singles in his uh, money pouch. Comes in very handy in these situations.